This is future Angela. You're about to see a filmed spoiler vlog chat of House of Chains, which was an exhausting experience for me. And I don't want to paint over that with like my rose tinted glasses right now of currently reading Midnight Tides because I am currently reading Midnight Tides and loving it. You can look forward to content in the nearish future for that. It takes me a long time to read Malazan books. But I did want to say that like I am relatively negative near the end of this video because of um, for myself just not as huge of a payoff with House of Chains as I wanted. But after filming that I did watch Jimmy's live show discussion for House of Chains which I'll link down below. And I loved discussing that book with people and it got me so excited that I started Midnight Tides right away, which just like affirms to me what I've been saying in my wrap ups and at the end of this video that House of Chains is not going to be my favorite on first read, but has the most ability to become a favorite in the future. And there were so many things I appreciated even more discussing it with people. And yeah, so I just wanted you to know that even though the end of this is a little it's a little disappointed, a little negative. In general, though, I'm still really, really enjoying my experience with Malazan to the point where I have already purchased the ebook and audiobook of Midnight Tides and have already started it. And I mean, I've only read the prologue in chapter one, but I think this one will be my favorite. So without further preamble, you're going to be sent back in time <laughs> to past Angela. And yeah, this video is mostly me just trying to figure out what what is happening <laughs> which do i find the answer probably not but that that's what you have in store <laughs> and yeah thanks thanks for watching all right it's time to start the spoiler chat for house of chains i have finished part one as i do in a lot of these videos i will have timestamps for when i check in and i tend to check in after each part and most of the books lately have had four parts and i don't think house of chains is different if i'm wrong check the timestamps. So if you're reading this along with me and you want to check in as I have my thoughts and hypotheses, feel free. Or you can just watch it all in one go if you're just like a Malazan fan who likes to watch people make absurd guesses as they read books, feel free. And um, per usual, no spoilers that would pertain to future works or anything like that. I have only read the first three books and by the time this video goes up, the fourth one, and I don't want to be spoiled. Everyone's been really good about it, and obviously if I'm wrong, just let me be wrong. It's fine. I'm sure I will correct myself eventually. <laughs> it won't be the end of the world, but I also know as someone who loves other series when people are wrong, it's like so easy to just like want to type it, so I feel you. But unless it's like very obviously on the page, it's not like something that like will be pieced together in the future or whatever, just, just let me live in ignorance. It'll be great. So, <laughs> per usual reading a Malazan book, right? You think maybe, maybe I'll know the context. Maybe I'll know why things are happening. And I honestly thought that I would because this is kind of thought of as pseudo a sequel to Dead House Gates. And I kind of see where that's tying in now. But when I started, I was like, huh, we're on Genebacus. I thought we would be at the Seven Cities. Meanwhile, I'm just proud that I know that there are different continents now and that I have a better sense of where things are in the world. <laughs> but not only do we start on Genebacus, we start in a part of Genebacus we have never been, like way up north with the Teblor. Um, and the Teblor are like humanoid, but I don't think they're human. And they seem like the history, I haven't wrapped my head around the history yet, but the history seems to be implied that they are part of a lot of the ancient races that we interact with. And there, there's... A lot going on there, especially with like there's the wall of people, um, the wall of their gods, like the seven gods. I don't know if all seven are still there, but that's obviously like false gods sort of thing. And there's this whole thing with their culture that they were set on purpose to value violence and pillaging and stuff to a like make it so that they're more genetically diverse and don't accidentally stay with their tribes too much, because I assume that would lead to um, genetic problems, I guess that's kind of mentioned in the book. And, but I, I don't actually know all of the reason I, I did highlight it, but like, I was just like, this is an interesting way to, um, make clear why you have such a violent race of people. Cause they really are. <laughs> and the main character is Karsa Olang. And I've already been asked by many people in the community. So what do you think of him? And my answers are complicated. <laughs> I, 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 I have mixed feelings in the best of ways when it comes to this type of character, you know? He is so arrogant and like so violent and possessive and like at first he's just really hard to read from. Like he literally, like one of his friends 
like basically goes brain dead and no empathy no caring that's like really hard to see it's like you're you you just he's very accepting of really harsh things and like he's very harsh with his friends um at least well friends i don't even know if he has friends right like (laughs) with the people we presume are his friends who are traveling with him and like he's just so cocky at the beginning and then he gets captured right he's a slave and while he's dealing with this and he meets um i can't remember the first the first name but the nom character the thieving rig guy who i love (laughs) their dynamic was perfect while they're interacting and he keeps going in and out of consciousness as he's being captured and transported and going through hallucinatory things where he's connected to some warren i don't know what but it has like the chains in the sky and (sighs) i don't think it's hood but I don't think his gods are happy. Like, there's something going on there where they need someone to accomplish a task for them, and they want it to be Karsa Olang, and I don't know why. It's murky to me, and it's, I think, intentionally obfuscated from me. I don't think I'm supposed to know right now why they care. I have it highlighted so I can refer back to it later, because I think I haven't mentioned this time. In my past reading experiences, I physically read it only, and in the last two books I was annotating on the page, And the books have just gotten too big. And this time I decided to still physically read it with the e-reader. I bought the Kindle while listening to the audiobook, which has been fantastic. (laughs) It really helps with the flow and getting different character voices and like the cadence of how these characters talk has been really cool. And so I'm able to easily highlight and I can refer back to those things later when I'm like trying to connect the dots of all these things. But I loved the interaction of Karsa Olang and the Nam character. I, I just loved him being like, this is too many words. He's like, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> this is who I am. And like that, that trust and that like camaraderie that formed, like I'm kind of sad that it's implied that they're not going to be around each other anymore. And I was, I was prepared to be broken if Nam was dead and he wasn't. So thank goodness. I was so happy when he was like, the here comes the cavalry moment at the end of this part to come save him again. <laughs> Like, for how strong and resourceful Karsa Olang is, he's gotten captured so many times since I've met him. Like, so many times. But he has so many cool properties because they're like these giant people and they obviously have something in their their blood because of where they lived in Genabacus that had that, like, metal stuff that makes it so that magic doesn't work on them as much. And, like, every time a sorcerer is like, oh, shit, it doesn't work. I'm just like, this is so cool. So I like that we're following him now. At first I was like, uh, this is another story of this type of, like, at first you feel like you've seen Karsa Olang before, you know? And although I'm not necessarily thinking he's like some new invention of a character, he is more dynamic than I expected him to be so early on, which is exciting. And I can tell that he's going to be very interesting to follow at this point in history in the Malazan world, especially now that we're with, I think it's Leoman, who we did meet in Dead House Gates, who's taking him to the Shaikh, who I think at this moment is Felicity. And that's something I haven't quite figured out yet. I need to like compare the years because I think initially when we start, we're like still in Gardens of the Moon. Because like Gardens of the Moon and Dead House Case kind of happen in parallel timeline wise, right? Like not exactly, but kind of. And so I think House of Chains kind of starts in the past and then we kind of catch up to now. And so I think at this point, Felicity's the chosen one, but I'm not positive. Because I was trying to connect other things that were happening because we have that Warren with the water, which is, I'm pretty sure, the same Warren we had in Dead House Gates. And we have the boat with the people that is being run by the orders without their heads. But it didn't have the people that were last on the boat from Dead House Gates, I'm pretty sure. So I feel like they're the reason why there were only ore men on that boat. And so then in Dead House Gates, the people who find the boat find the boat with the water Warren thing. Like That's what my brain's kind of putting together could be really off base and I missed some crucial clues or something like that so the timeline is unsure to me but I'm assuming this Teblor Carson Olong is going to meet Felicin and that's interesting to me <laughs> gosh two very very opinionated characters <laughs> getting to meet each other um I let's see do I have any other like thoughts right now nope I'm just excited for them to meet um also I mean although still a confusing book and things like that you know like most malazan books like here new part of the world new character new cultures have fun like which is the fun of malazan right i found this to be a pretty linear storytelling format so far to be for these 200 some pages with one character perspective 
because we haven't had that yet in a Malazan book. And I found that quite refreshing. I don't know if that's going to continue in other parts. I think I was told that it doesn't way back in the past. Obviously, by the time you're seeing this video, I already know the answer to that question. But it, it was really interesting and immersive to be with this one character for so long. And I did love instantly when Carson Olong was with the Malazan people and um, with the slave traders and stuff, which I feel like I've read the name Stigler before, but I, ha I can't remember if that's just like in a different book or in this series. And I couldn't find it. I went through the character indices for the other three books and it didn't come up in those contents. But I feel like that slave um, trader is familiar to me, but I don't know why. So there's that. But it was so cool as I was reading the book and just being like, oh, I actually know what they're talking about. Like when they first mentioned where they went into port in the seven cities, I'm like, I know where that is. I, I, I know about where we are. And like when they mentioned the path to that Raraku desert thing. I'm, I'm pronouncing everything wrong and I'm sorry. I'm not good at fantasy words. But I was like, I, I know where that is on the map. I don't have to look at the map. I have like a global picture of the things. This is great. I'm, I'm learning things. I know different cultures. Like when the Tebler were fighting the Malazans, like I understood the resilience of the Malazans that he wasn't prepared because we learned so much about how they fight and stuff in previous books. Like I feel more grounded, even though I'm still confused, especially because the Ascendants and the Gods and the Warrens are, you know, doing their thing way up here and I'm, you know, way down here and I'm like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm excited to find out. So that's this check-in. I'll check in after I've read part two and we'll see where I'm at. All right, we're going to have to excuse the lighting and any sounds you may or may not hear because it is a Thursday night on a Boston street in a college town. It's going to be loud and I have to do this now because I want to read House of Chains tomorrow and if I don't get my part two thoughts in, I won't feel comfortable starting part three and I know that's an arbitrary rule, but we're doing it. And I, um, this is my red string on a wallpaper because this section is just the puzzle piece section. <laughs> and I worked really hard to like read it all just as a narrative and just like highlight things as I went and then I spent like a good 30 minutes this afternoon going through all my highlights and trying to like piece together all of the connections I just couldn't make in real time. And I'm actually like really glad I did because there are some interesting puzzle pieces surrounding like all the different cultures and the Warrens and just like the different factions, not only in this conflict, but factions globally in the magic nature system. Like we finally have a character who can interact with the old magic who's in um, strings slash fiddlers <laughs> troop. He needs one of the Meneas menace menace one of these illusion darkness warrens which apparently a big theme there's just a lot of warrens and there's there's elder warrens and there's other warrens because the warrens are all connected with different levels of ascendance and we all like there's you know the tiering of them like kind of what i've always equated to titans and olympians and etc but it seems like kind of similar to like titans olympians and whatever there always is a lightness and a darkness sort of warren system and so it seems like shadow darkness and light all of the magic surrounding those things are very present. Like even Fiddler and them notice in their contingency that there are, they have three mages and all of them are the illusion shadow mage born people. So that's like a thing that I had to look up because I really like, I kept hearing all of these names and I knew some of them meant the same thing, but like were just different tiers. The glossary in the back is useful for that. So yeah, so Fiddler, Strings. I think I like Fiddler as a name more. I, I actually, I don't know why he changed his name to Strings. I was looking at my old vlog for Dead House Gates and reminding myself what happened to Fiddler at the end of that. And I'm pretty sure he just re-enlisted to join the Malazan army in the Seven Cities to help him out. Um, I don't remember what his internal motivation was for that. And like, I mean, I don't even know really the history, I think, behind why he was called Fiddler, or maybe I did, and that was in Dead House Gates, and I forgot. You can correct me if it's within these four books in the comments, per usual. Please do not spoiler the other six, because that would be a bummer. <laughs> but, so I don't know why his name is Strings now, but regardless, he goes by Strings now, and he's met other people. And what's been interesting in this section is how overall we are finding these people learning information that we as a reader have already seen, because we have globally been hopping about so like we already know what's happened to the bridge burners we we've already known these big events that happened in genovacus and people are catching up and i now firmly really do know where carsa olong's part was so it definitely was where i thought it was 
And he actually, we did meet for the first time in Dead House Gates with um, the Shaikh elder. He was one of the, the guardians then. So we met him for the first time two books ago and just like, didn't know he was Car so long, which I am excited to see where his plot goes because seeing who he is now versus who he was in part one and how he plays into the house of change is is fascinating so that's just one thing we have lots of names i've also been noticing this really big emphasis on family like thematically this idea of family is so strong like not only do we have kind of this whole star wars symptom of tavare perrin and felicin being this family unit that is so important on every level of the scale for our storyline which I'm comparing it to Star Wars just because like a lot of people always compare the Star Wars movies like this is a Skywalker story right like in the main movies not including like the spin-offs it's always about a Skywalker most of the time um I mean I think all of the movies have a Skywalker in it <laughs> so that's like what I was thinking of it's just like this family unit's a big deal and then we learn a little bit about the origin of the Malazan Empire and how Dancer was making his own family and stuff like that and I think there was a quote that like the strength and flaws of emperors is the family and like the humanity as a family was also brought up and how like it's just family kept coming up and it keeps being really important and I like that and I like the different angles and the different types of family we're looking at and like I don't know if it'll happen in this book because I don't think we're gonna see Perrin in this book like they're talking about Perrin because he's the master of the decks but I don't think we're gonna see him but regardless Felicin and Tavare are going to have a confrontation right and like and there's some bad blood there because Tavare was trying to do right by the family honor doing what she did with Felicin and tried to give her you know the talent to protect her but obviously your 15 year old sister who just had to prostitute herself and like do drugs to survive the mines it's probably gonna have a grudge just a little grudge and now she has a goddess in her potentially so you know that's the whole thing also in terms of like names again Bodin younger which that's a younger I don't know if younger so like if this is like a song of ice and fire syndrome where like there are certain last names that are just given to people if they don't already have a last name because if it's true we have Bodin younger we have talk the younger and then Fel the younger Felicin is called Felicin younger and like I don't think she's connected like I think it's just more like we have Felicin the Chosen One and then Felicin Younger like she was named Felicin which is my I am okay keeping track of all the names but one of my biggest pet peeves is having duplicate names <laughs> oh it's bothered me ever since I read Wuthering Heights in high school and I understand it's thematic and I understand it has a purpose but I don't like it but regardless we have the younger Felicin who I do like as a character I just sometimes I, it took me a while before we got into part two to really be like, okay, so they're really only calling the younger Felicin Felicin, and the other one is being called the Chosen One or the Shaikh Reborn. Like, we are separating those out. We really aren't referring to Felicin and Deadhouse Gates by that name anymore. So that was helpful once I felt confident in that, but I wasn't confident in that in a while. <laughs> So that was a thing. So we got we got lots of names changes for different reasons, which honestly, yeah, that's been happening since Gardens of the Moon back with the Empress. You know, she had the name Sultry and then changes it to Empress Lacine. Like, name is very tied to identity, which I do believe. Like, I mean, I, I am Angela. I don't really, if I were to change my name, there would have to be a huge reason for it, a very meaningful one. So I get that. So I guess I already said we've learned a little bit about the empire forming and kind of what, why it wanted to be and what I think is interesting is it really was so far implied power for power's sake like conquest um but it does seem to provide like order to a region that didn't have order that was being just as harmful if not more harmful to the citizens is what is implied whether or not I believe that I don't know if I've had like good narrators to tell me what is good or best for the common man because we mostly get military perspectives and even like the rebellion perspectives have been military but um I, there's these this I don't know if this word's come up before, but Nepans, this is um, a race or ethnicity of people that um, the Empress is from, and I don't know what continent they're from originally. I don't know if it was brought up before, and I just missed it. But apparently they they're they're important, like and I don't I need, I'm just like I have it as a note to keep an eye out for it because like that's just like a thing. Ooh, there was also a really cool quote about the metamorphosis of culture. <laughs> I think this is something that uh. Strings was saying because he was talking about how some cultures are, are more adversarial and some aren't and in order to be able to confront this other one 
that in order to win, they'd have to metamorphosize themselves into something. And I feel like that's already been seen in the Jaghut Talana Moss confrontation we've talked about earlier in the series and stuff like that. And I just think that's an interesting nugget to think about. I just think that's a very thoughtful idea. So I wrote that down because I liked that. I like that the boat people are back. <laughs> like the people who went through the fire war and, and, and like when Coltane and them interacted, like noses were broken, like that happened in Dead House Gates. So I just like seeing them. I think they're funny. I, I loved all of the banter per usual with the military people, the sappers and everything. I love it. Those are my favorite things, especially with the audiobook now too. It's just even more enhanced because yeah. Um, Crocus is Cutter. I have found the Crocus parts and Aspilar the least interesting so far, but could get more interesting because that is where we also are getting insight into the Shadow Throne. I think it's the Shadow Throne. It's one of the Shadow Things. Could be wrong about which one, but I feel like we keep mentioning a throne who, like, that is tied to the Tisti Andy. Because now I've learned there's three Tisties, and in the back, one is Shadow, and one is... What did I write it down? Mm, one's light. I think that's the Losan who like think they're the pure ones. And then the Ador, oh, I forget which ones they were. It's in the back of the book. But they each kind of have an affinity, I think, kind of sort of to one of these Warrens, like darkness, shadow, and light, maybe. Which is interesting. And we're starting to learn more about this race of people. And they're very interesting because they're so old. And we even have a character who's Tisti Ador. And I think the Tisti Ador is supposed to like invade this island. And Crocus is sent... Well, Cutter is sent by Cotillion to figure this out because Cotillion is with the Shadowborn. And now, as Cutter, he is of the assassin thing, like Ralik Nam, who's been brought up. We haven't seen him send Gardens of the Moon, but maybe he shows up this book. Who knows? Even um, Cotillion was like, I don't know if he's alive, but don't. It was a very wink, wink, nudge, nudge sort of thing. Um, so, you know, wouldn't be surprised if that happened. I did like that it was implied that Cotillion did not know that the Talons were still around, which, like, I like that for multiple reasons. One... I like when pe people don't know things necessarily, but also it's an ascendant who is like not that it really emphasizes that these are humans or they, mortal beings that became something more, but still have some of their flaws or aren't just aren't all knowing. I think that's really cool. So let's see. I think I have a few more things. Hebron and the Jade Giant. Don't know what's happening there, but it's obviously important. And it's nice to have a few more answers to the questions of like, what did he touch in Dead House Gates? And I still don't really know. It seems to be implied that when this Warren was open or something, the Odotarl was made or something. There were some attempts at explanations when he was talking to this one other mage person. Don't remember. Or maybe he's a priest. Regardless, they were exchanging information because Hebrick knew that Perrin was the thing. They, they each knew something the other one wanted to know. So we had a nice little, like, tea time chat about that. Kalam, of course, he's not with the children anymore. <laughs> that lasted for all of, like, a book. <laughs> like, well, obviously, time's also weird. But he is off. He's also working for... It might also be Cotillion um, to get stuff done. And he's found people in a province of the Seven Cities and is helping them handle things but he hasn't done anything like super interesting yet and then Karsa Olog so we have this idea that things can be trapped in stone and sculptures and stuff and so he was making these sculptures in the whirlwind or Raraku or whatever it's supposed to be pronounced um it should be better pronunciations now that I do the audiobooks but he was doing that and he like kind of revived his two friends and so lead us war leaders back man it's back baby it's great <laughs> and now he's kind of like a war leader worth following and I thought it was interesting what he had to say about the Malazan Empire because like the Malazan Empire we have known um for sure since Dead House Gates maybe not as well in Gardens of the Moon that they have a code like yes they are for conquest yes they are for control and power but they have a code and we really see that in Dead House Gates where they are putting it all out on the line to protect these refugees and so it's one of those things where you kind of see him parting ways with them and he goes back to be using the name Karsa Olang more and not the name that he had with the Shaikh Elder, which is like names are very interesting. They are really tied to who you are and your motivations because he was being called by um, a different name. I can't remember it now. But and then it drifted to Karsa Olang as he was deciding to leave. And we still have those seven people that I don't know what they are. And there's a lot of seven. There's so much seven. Seven is a very important number. I don't really know what it means yet, but there is so much so much seven and i think those are my thoughts oh i don't know what the theloman toblakai are but they're apparently related to karsa olong's people and i think the talanamas are too i need to like go through my notes and try and connect 
all of the sto- history lessons and stories for that, but I did not have a chance because I think a lot of those are also in book one. So maybe at the end, I will attempt that mini history lesson for myself. But yeah, definitely the puzzle section, which is typically part two <laughs> of a Malazan book for me is like, oh, here's a bunch of people and we're, we have to set up all the threads and then you can follow the threads come together, which I'm totally fine with because all the threads are relatively interesting. Like I said, my least favorite are like Kalam and Cutter right now. Cause, mainly because I don't know what Cotillion wants. And I'm least interested in what that Ascendant wants of the Mormon. Like, I think it's interesting that he's not on the same page. Is that like the, the head guy? But it's whatever. So now, tomorrow, I can read part three. So hopefully my random string on a wall was remotely interesting to anyone. But I am having a good time with this book so far. So I finished part three and it's not becoming more clear what's going on. There's just so much happening. Like I know there is something happening with the Tistis, like all of them, the Andy, Adur, and the Lieso, whatever, the light ones. And then there's obviously a lot happening with the Talana Mas, not to mention with the Warrens in general and people fighting for the Shadow Throne. And then there's just the Elder Shadow, Shadow Warren that is the Whirlwind. And then we just have like the normal basic politics of the Malazan Empire wanting to keep the Seven Cities continent. Th- there's just so many things. And then of course the House of Chains is now in the deck, right? So these are, I guess, the main things that have been happening in very like disjointed ways <laughs> throughout the story that I've been trying to keep track of. Like last time I-, I wrote down a bunch of notes after I finished part three to try and f- just figure out what was happening. And it's a lot and there are so many chains so many chains, which I know, it, it, I know why, it's, 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 <laughs> it's very on the nose why there are so many chains. I do like, though, the implication that the House of Chains is like um, the god that wor- worships imperfection, and it's meant to, what was the phrase, um, get, get rid of the order versus dissolution battle, that there really is no evil, there's just a reassignment of powers and nothing ever really changes. I think that's really interesting and really speaks to how like this rebellion that's happening that was already talked about in part two by um, Carlos Olong that like this rebellion is not really going to help the average person. It's just readjusting power. It's not changing the system. So then that makes me wonder, is the House of Chains a good thing? Because up to this point, I have not been led to believe that the crippled god is a good thing. <laughs> But who knows? Uh, we haven't really, like, directly talked to the Crippled God. I'm pretty sure Karsa Olang is chosen for his part of the deck, but I don't know if he's really committed because he kind of just, like, not killed, but cut in half one of the seven... Oh, they're called something else now. The Unbound. That's what they're called. Who are Talana Mas, so that's cool. I'm also trying to figure out, and it's very unclear to me, and if it's not clear by the end of this book, feel free someone correct me, but without spoiling anything, Toblakai. Is that like a great greater race and then there's stuff underneath it? Because I was trying to figure this out, but it seems like there's Toblakai and then underneath that are like the Trell, the Bargast, the Teblor. But then what are the Fen? Are the Fen also in that? Or is Toblakai a separate thing? And then what is a Telamon Toblakai specifically? Is that just Karsa Olang? I spent a bit of time trying to go through my Kindle notes and like searching words to try and figure this out and like I'm still still a little more confused about that whole thing than I want to be. Not that it's a big deal. It's just like a part of the world building where I'm just like, what? And then I figured out the name for the flooding warrant is the nascent. So that was kind of cool. These are all things that I just kind of wish were explained to me as I was reading it just a little bit. It would provide some interesting context because I get really excited about it after I read the section and I make the connections. But if I just like knew those connections while he was reading, it'd be cool. But my brain's just not big enough for that apparently. So... So many things have happened. So we have this character called the Traveler, who I don't know if we've met before, but the Traveler apparently is connected to Dancer and the former Emperor, and he now is the person protecting the Shadow Throne, and because that's where Cutter and Aspilar and Cotillion were, and Cotillion fighting was really cool. And that's where a lot of the Tisti Adur died, and um, Adamander Reich's brother died. <laughs> and then there was a sword that was given to the Traveler. And that's all we know about this island. Like, this Cotillion Cutter subplot is so sparse and varied. I'm wondering how it's going to wrap up at the end of this. And I liked that Cotillion is, like, learning, oh, the Talons are still around and stuff like that. Like, that was interesting. And the parallels of Cutter holding Aspilar and Cotillion holding his old friend who was a Talon. There was some interesting stuff there, but I honestly don't know what's happening. 
I can kind of understand the idea of the Tisti Adur wanting power, so that's why they're trying to overthrow the Tistiandi on this shadow throne. How many shadow thrones can there be? Obviously, like, three, right? Because you have the one for the Tisti Andy, and then we have the one that has, like, Cotillion in them, or is that the same one? And then we have the Whirlwind, which is a type of Elder Shadow Warren. Like, oh my goodness. There's so much duplicity here. Like, like the redundancy of the system is strong, which, fair. That's how it is in biology, too. So if one fails, you have something that can pick it up. But so much redundancy. It's so confusing from my brain. <laughs> And then you have the Talana Moss fighting the Tisti Liaoso or whatever. And whatever's happening with Onrak and um, what's his name? Uh, Trell Senglar. No idea what's happening there. I like think I remembered at one point who they were. I think one of them was the person from the prologue. But I think that's who Onrak was. But I'm unsure. And I have no clue what's happening with that. I've, I know they ran into Karsa Olong at the end of this part. And that was kind of funny. But I don't know what their purpose is or what they're doing. They just keep ending up in interesting situations. Similar with Pearl and Lestara, who just keep ending up in cool places and like seeing an austeral dragon. Which, what does that even mean? They also saw um, a place where Hood showed up and that really freaked Pearl out. So like, there's just a lot of pairings of people that are seeing interesting things but have no context. And like, I trust that the conclusion of this book will make it all worth it for me. But right now, I am more confused than I've ever been. Like, I'm just, I feel like a conspiracy theorist. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> There's so much string. I spend so much time trying to put it together. So hopefully, because I, I don't even really understand what the plot of this book is. I think the plot is watching the Tavares army get to the rebel army and then seeing that clash. But most of the time is not spent with either one of those um, uh, parents. You know, like most of the time is spent with these larger than life Warrens and beings and things like that. Um, I do like the time we spent with Tavare's army. Um, and we ha now like really have a distinction that these more blue shaded people that we had on the boat in Deathhouse Gates, they went through this fire Warren and that's what the Tisti Liaosa are like trying to find. And that's all really interesting. And then uh, we had this reveal of this guy, Lorik, who was talking to Heberic who is like the son of the god of the Tisti Liaos. I don't know if I'm saying their name correctly, but the Tisti L people, the light people, those people. Um, what happened to young Felicin is horrible. I knew she was going to be assaulted. I did not know she was going to be... I, I can't even say it. <laughs> like, I can't even say what happened to her. Like, that was beyond disgusting. Like, oh my god, I can't... can't even... So I really hope the the character who did that, what's what that priest, I don't remember his name, just, just dies a very, very horrible death. <laughs> oh, I hate him. Um, we have uh, another thing that we've learned about. There's these jade giants that in theory maybe came through and not through a warn, but like punctured reality to show up. And that's part of the Otaral and it's related to Hebrick, who's now being controlled by Treach, um, a different god of war. I mean, Fenner died anyways, right? So... So that's like another nugget of like, what's happening? And then, you know, you just wonder, what are Warrens? What is this? Is this just like multi-dimensions and these are connectors between them? Like, is this snap suddenly sci-fi? <laughs> what is happening? And yeah, Karsa Olong's part though is the most fun for me. Cause he's just the breaker of chains and it's very clear. I like how he undid the unbound, but then also brought them down. Like, I just like that he was removing chains and all he wanted to do was get a horse and along the way met some Jaguts, helped them out, so they helped him get a horse. And then just casually, this Jag Hut is in a house of Azeth, which, you know, we've gone a whole book almost before mentioning one of those weird things. So there we are. And I guess this one, was this, I, this might have been the one we met in Dead House Gates because they were talking about Ikerium, who showed up and punched Karsa Olong, and that was really fun. <laughs> Mapo, Karsa, Olong, and Ikerium interacting was interesting. I was hoping for more Ikerium and Mapo this book. I'm actually kind of sad we don't get them as much. But it's whatever. And so <laughs> that was the whole thing. And then I guess another small tidbit is that there's this song that Kalam and Fiddler or Strings keep hearing that has to do, I think, with that horn he was given in Deadhouse Gates, the Tano song or something. Oh yeah, Kalam's been doing things. He woke up a demon and had to figure that out and ended up with the Iskalar pust person and yeah I that's another one that just like cutter I'm just like okay I don't understand I know probably there's a reason why I have to be updated about where you are and what you're doing but I don't know the bigger picture yet and I trust Erickson to give me that bigger picture but right now 
I hope he doesn't introduce any new puzzle pieces because I have too many right now. I feel like I have too many blank spaces <laughs> and I need a few of them to be filled in. But, but we'll see what happens. I'm really confused about what's going to go on. I wonder if Tavare is ever going to realize that it's her sister that she's going to be fighting in this rebellion. I... I really don't understand what the Tisti people are doing. Like, I know they're from another planet. Uh, I don't I don't know what the Talana Moss are doing. I, they keep talking about renegades. Like, I remember at the end of last book, there was this whole contingent of them who wanted to die, but then realized they had a new cause to fight for. But I also knew there was a contingent that, may, they, that were renegades, and maybe Onrak was part of that. I'm confused about the Talana Moss, because then you also have the Unbound, who were ancient Talana Moss that were like, I guess, in, captured in those statues. So I, I'm, there's a lot, there's a lot of moving pieces. This is 3D chess, and I'm not even good at 2D chess. But here's hoping that my brain <laughs> will be better in the last part. All right, so I have finished House of Chains, and I have conflicting thoughts. <laughs> I've already kind of talked about this spoiler-free in other parts of my channel, but in case you're just here for my Malazan content and you don't watch those other things, I'll elaborate on them here. So a lot of very epic things happen at the end of this book, as they always do, and there is a convergence, which if I didn't know there was a convergence, Erickson reminded me about 25 times. I mean, he did use the word at least 20 times. I'm, I was just like, I, I get it. Like, I understand, the threads are coming together. Um, that was the thing I didn't love as much about this book versus other ones, is that I'm not used to him being repetitive, and he was oddly repetitive in his theming and word choice, um, which was odd to me. It wasn't something I had noticed in the first three books, but in this one, like, he used the word chain over 200 times, which, like, I, I don't know, I, I got it. <laughs> like, I got it the first time. And maybe, you know five times would have been good but it was it was a lot like i got we, lots of chains and i mean it's called house of chains it's a new thing in the deck of dragons fine it just like i guess the things i was really interested in we weren't getting as much as i wanted so i was really just getting by the end of it exhausted i was just was so confused i was so like what are we doing and then the ending had things that were really cool but didn't quite land for me the same. Like, I think the biggest moment for me was when Gamut died. How he joined the soldiers at the end to do that that whole night thing where they got rid of the war dogs, I think was their name. Um, and how there was the reveal after it that he did all of that already dead. Like, that was, that was something special. I thought that really hit more than I expected. But for some reason, the Tavare Felicin um, contact, like, it was cool and made sense. And um, is quite sad that she doesn't realize she killed her own sister. But for some reason didn't land for me. I don't know why. And then obviously there were things that were really interesting about Felicin and the goddess. And how we learned the goddess is a wrong Talan Amas woman because of Onric and stuff like that. So like there were some interesting reveals. The sea coming back was was something learning about the bridge burners ascending which I kind of thought about at the end of last book I was like there's no way they're not ascending <laughs> like come on um which to have that confirmed and how Kalam and Fiddler could hear this song like there were a lot of interesting moments and reveals that I did appreciate but at the same time I I didn't feel as satisfied as I'm used to feeling at the end of a Malazan book Part of that is I'm, I'm really confused and I know that when I reread this book, and I will reread it, and I'm continuing on with Malazan books, that things will make more sense. But I think, like, I'm annoyed that this was a choice he made. Like, it's, a, it's an active choice, which I, I can't fault someone who does art to art the way that they want to, but he actively chose to make certain things not make sense in the time that the information is given to me. And normally, I'm very patient with that. I'm very fine with that. Like, Gardens of the Moon, I loved. Most of that book does not make sense till you read future books. And even now, I don't know everything that happens in Gardens of the Moon. But I was fine with that. Part of that is Gardens of the Moon is much shorter. And the ending of that book really lined things up. This one obviously does have really strong moments. But at the same time, I never was given a chance to care about anyone in this book. Because the biggest person we had point of views from was Karsa Olong. 
and he has an interesting arc, but we, like, then we take time away from him to spend, like, little moments with a bunch of people. So it wasn't like Deadhouse Gates, where I got split into, like, thirds, and Memories of Ice, I already knew a lot of those people from Gardens of the Moon. So this one was just, like, really weird for me in terms of character work. Like, I just really wasn't as connected to people as I wanted to be, which was a bummer. I mean, like, I still had my favorite moments. Like, I think... I think I mentioned it in the last one. If not, I'll mention it here. I love the scorpion fight. Like, you know, I, it, there were things that I really did like when I was with the Malazans and things like that. And there were lots of, lots of reveals and implications in the world. Like, we met a new type of Tist. So now we have three types of Tist that I know about. The Adore, the Andy, and I guess it's Leosin. And the Leosin were kind of like, sort of our comic relief. <laughs> like, how they were going to fight truth and stony stormy in them and then they just decided you know they're not to blame let's go find the dragon like that was funny but also that time like that plot arc i'm sure is important for future things in future books but maybe all of the time we've been talking about chains i could just get some context and maybe i've already been giving it but i've already forgotten from a thing tool said in the first book or something like that i don't know so i just feel frustrated but at the same time I can't wait to start Midnight Tides <laughs> it's really weird the series is really weird and I kind of wish like it had like a course where I could really deep dive with other people which like kind of exist in Malaz tube right like people post videos on like specific chapters and you can do it it's just whew, it's an undertaking and this is just the first book for me that just didn't have the payoff that I'm used to like, in an emotional way that the other ones have had. Like, from, like, a remove-my-reading-experience point of view and just looking at what exists, I'm so intrigued about when these things will, like, lock into place as I read further in the series. And, like, it's not like I even disagree with the themes that I found were very repetitive in this. Like, yes, break the chains. Like, I get that. Like, you know, like, I don't know. It's just... I guess... I don't like authors to philosophize too much, and maybe that's just a thing he likes to do, and I just need to get used to it. And, and you know, like I said, not going to tell someone how to art, but in terms of my enjoyment of this book, I think it suddenly started to take me out of the story every time I read the word chain or convergence. Because I think it was somewhere in part three where I was just like, oh my god, chains again? And I decided I was reading this on my Kindle. I went and I searched, and there's 275 instances. Like, I, maybe that's not exactly it, but it was 270-something. And I was like, goodness, and that's just chain, not chains or chained. And I don't know exactly how the search engine works for it, but I was just like, that's a lot. And then when you get to part four, you can't go, like, four pages without someone saying convergence. And I'm like, I get it. Like... I get it. They're, like, to give multiple characters multiple names and to have magic systems have multiple definitions and lineages, but to use the same word for something over and over again, like, I don't know. It was, it was a choice that, like, I didn't enjoy. You know, I don't know. That's just my experience. It's been a couple days since I finished it and I've, like, sat with it and, like, I'm used to the fatigue in reading these books, but I'm also used to, like, a very cathartic feeling at the end and I didn't get that. But I'm excited for Midnight Tides. I know it's a different time period, a different part of the world. I think it's with the Tist Edouard. So I, I already know that, and that's fine. Because one of, I guess, the good things about this series is that since I haven't really ever been allowed to get super attached to characters, like, they, they show up and they reoccur, but I don't get, like, the page time with them that I would need to, like, be like, I know who you are. Um, I don't mind getting a new set of characters to start to follow and see what they do in the world. Like, that's another thing, though. Like, this is my third book with Absalar and, um, Crocus, or Cutter, whatever you want to call him. And I, I don't care about them, and that kind of sucks. Like, I loved Sari slash Aspilar in Gardens of the Moon, and I loved Crocus in Gardens of the Moon, and the more time I've had with them, I somehow care about them less. Like, I felt bad for him that Absalar left him, and, like, I see that his life has changed, and now he's becoming a, an assassin, and he works with Cotillion, which the Cotillion stuff in this book was really cool. I, I'm very into Cotillion, and, like, whoever the Traveler is would like to learn more. <laughs> Hopefully will in the future. Like, there's a lot of cool stuff, but, like, them particularly, I was like, I just haven't spent enough time with you to, like, 
care that you're breaking up with your girlfriend. Like, I don't, I don't know. I just, it, it kind of sucks. But, I don't know. Sorry for everyone who this is their favorite book. I think I'm on the side where this is just on a first read. Not my thing, but I do predict that on reread, this is the one that will, it will grow the most, most for me. Because, gosh, the, there's a lot of stuff that could be really cool with context. I was just not given context, like, 70% of the time, so... It just is what it is. But I'm going to stop rambling because I feel like eventually I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. And if you made it this far and want to leave me an emoji, I guess leave me a chain. <laughs> uh, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.